Welcome, my name is Joseph Bernal, and I will be presenting on cybersecurity in government, ethical foundations, career metrics, and career opportunities in the US. So in order to understand uh, cybersecurity in government, uh, we need to take a look at the current situation. So right now, cybersecurity is identified as one of the most important threats facing the nation in the 21st century. It seems also to be a new threat that most governments are not accustomed to. So in order to address that, we need a new type of technician. Who's gonna help defend uh, government in response to these type of threats? So this is where the cybersecurity specialist is identified. Is that person, he or she, who is able to ident identify and respond to particular security threats with regards to um, information. So they receive some sort of training and this is what is apparent right now in a lot of both the private sector in programs that like Microsoft, for example, who identify um, various programs offering training in cybersecurity and uh, in the public initiatives and institutions like the El Paso Community College that offer an associate in cybersecurity. So there seems to be a big demand for these new skilled technicians. But in order to understand why there's this need, we first need to understand, well, how is that relation in terms of the government? What does this cybersecurity have to do with the government though? So we need to look at a broader scale. What is the government in the first place? So there are many theories regarding uh, how governments get arise in the first place, how they get established. Um, they may be for, some researchers have identified ecological advantages. Uh, they might be next to a river. Uh, there's good soil, things like that. Um, security advantages. Um, there might be, uh, for example, it's stronger in numbers to keep together and work together than it is to be an individual. And so this notion of collectively accumulating resources and as soon as you have them you have to of course protect those resources and the need to protect those resources and the accumulation of these resources you start to arise a particular identity a group identity um, it could be political and cultural and it's been identified by some researchers that this collective identity is the source and the establishment of what we call a nation state or a government, that there seems to be some collective uh, motivation and goals shared amongst this group. And this is where we address what is a term contractarianism. Contractarianism is a political theory, or at least originated as a political theory, and also became a moral theory. And this is where we get into the ethics of the, of the matter. That Contractarianism advocates that when we collectively join together and work in response to shared goals, is that what we want to do then is provide um, an agreement, some sort of negotiation where free, equal, and rational people would agree to. What do they mean by that? That they're free to do so, they are not coerced in this type of agreement. It's not forced upon them. Um, they came to this agreement on equal terms and that any rational person would agree to these terms, that there are not unfair terms, that they're not one-sided or biased, that we can, as an individual, see some sort of self-benefit. And part of contractarianism is the notion of social contract theory. Social contract theory is proposing that if contracts and agreements are the bedrock of 
any sort of government or nation or any structure, social structure, it could be an institution, it could be a school, anything like that, that we're motivated by some basic self-interest, that we see some collective um, or some individual benefit but that individual benefit can be met in a collective, best be met in a collective. What do we mean by that? Well, is that I'm willing to negotiate and make a deal as part of any uh, contract, right? I'm willing to negotiate and give up something, be it money, resources, or something like that, but I plan to gain in the process something in return. So there's a give and there's a gain sort of dynamic going on here. And this brings us to what does a government provide? Well, it provides security. That's, that's what we gain from it. But in a sense, we do have to give up some freedom in order to provide that security. So I can't simply take or do anything I want anymore if I am in an agreement that the government will provide some level of security. So notice this is how the police department works or any civil service works. I agree not to um, take anybody else's property and they agree not to take my property. If there's a violation of that, that we have government institutions to come in there and work that out for us. Be the, the court system, the policing system, any sort of institution will do that. And we collectively agree to do this through the exchange of our taxes, right? Tax money goes to these resources. So we're giving up a monetary resource in order for us to gain something back. Now, what are we gaining and what are we protecting in the 21st century? Well, it's been identified in regards to cybersecurity that we're gaining and protecting information. That information is the 21st century sort of resource. So instead of um, typical resources that we identify, you know, in society, water, food, it's a, where we're protecting here is sensitive information. So, and we entrust, and this is a responsibility of a government, to secure that information, right? That sensitive information. So like I said, it's not like food, water, oil, or something that we're accustomed to. And this is where a lot of governments are having trouble meeting the demands of the 21st century and cybersecurity, is trying to work out a new sense of security with a resource that is essential, but is not really tangible in, in the everyday sense. So bank accounts, credit card numbers, all this cyber information that we have needs to be protected, but it doesn't seem to have the same sort of physical limitations that something like food or water or oil would have. And so what is it that we need to protect in the first place? How is it information before it becomes a security issue? And this is where I'll bring up uh, James Blake. James Blake wrote a book called The Information, The History of Theory and Thought. And in it, he points out that, well, information has to be more than bits. We're accustomed to talking about information in the cybersphere as, as bits of information. But he points out, if it were merely bits, we wouldn't value them as much as we do. So if you take binary bits, the zeros and ones, there's certain zeros and ones that seem to be more important to us than others. And so this is why we can merely reduce information or treat information as bits. Instead, some philosophers have argued that information is something more important. There arises from bits, though, but it's not information itself. So there's different types of information. Um, Luciana Faridi has identified that information can be about something, like a train timetable. Information can also be as something, right? DNA or fingerprints, something that might be tangible. Information can be for something, an algorithm or instructions. Or information can be 
in something, a pattern, right? Something or constraint, something that we can identify in that way. So information has this wide sort of spectrum of what it can and what is possibly considered information. So how, what kind of information are we securing? We first have to identify well, what is the information type, right? So what is security information and how do we secure information if it can um, take these many forms? So it's usually identified, identified as in order to secure information and this as a government responsibility, we need to look at the relation between convenience, right? And security. And this is part where you see that connection with the give and gain of um, social contract theory. That if I want to have some sort of level of individual security in a government as a citizen, then there seems to be, I'm going to have to give up some level of freedom of convenience. That if I want to create a, a secure password, then I'm going to have to create a password that's not going to be easy to remember. So the principles of cybersecurity, what we want to look for in, in securing this resource that doesn't seem to be in, always in the same sense as those tangible, uh, typical resources like food and water, confidentiality, integrity, and availability are seen as principles to ensure this sort of um, need for security. So a principle is a rule that someone is, that lives by, that guides their behavior, that guides their intuitions, that marks the way in how they're gonna address life. So if we're talking about a principle of cybersecurity, we're talking about some sort of guideline that's going to direct us in a certain way. So if we honor confidentiality, that's going to guide how we're going to treat sensitive information. If we honor integrity, availability, these things are the guiding principles. So the acronym is usually called CIA, as these are the three pillars of how to address and, and what our principles are going to be bounded by, as well as another acronym, AAA, which is authentication, authorization, and accounting. We also want to look at, you know, who can access this information, who's authorized, right? Who's accountable? So these are some deep level ethical principles as well, connected with social contract that guides how we want to treat sensitive information, this new type of 21st century resource. And to consider that, we have to look at it as a three-layered system. So we need to look at, not at the products first, of course. So products means that, that there are various types of uh, security placed around this information. So they can be tangible or they cannot be virtual codes, locked doors, things like that. But we also have to look at a larger scope in the sense of, well, it's not just about the locked doors and it's not just about, you know, the codes. We also have to look at the agents, right? Who's implementing these particular security procedures, right? Like who is putting, who's making sure that the doors are locked? Who's making sure that there's a code in place? So the agent has to be um, in, uh, at focus and, well, it can't just be, I put a lock on the door or let me back, I can't just have a lock on the door. Who's making sure that someone is locking that door in the first place? Because lock is not gonna do any good unless you have somebody locking the door, right? But then that brings us to the third layer. Well, what is the procedure or policy to make sure that we do have somebody locking the door at all times? So is there a rule? Is there some sort of level of accountability that 
an agent to agree to lock the door. These are things that have to be thought of. So in order to provide security in the sense that we're talking about, we need to be able to look at the products, but also the agents involved and the policies that guide and dictate those agents' behavior. And that's where you hopefully see that conditional social contract, that these agreements can really work unless we follow through, right? And then we cannot gain security and resource if these systems are not in place. And that brings us, well, whose responsibility is it then to have these systems in place? According to a contractual look at it, we wanna see that it would be in a, one possible institution would be a government. So when we talk about government security, right? Cyber security, a main focus is protection that deters and is resilient to, to attacks. So when you're trying to develop a defense, right? In cybersecurity, you, what's helpful and very much in the social contract sense is the ability to deter an attack even before it happens. So if you can avoid an attack, if you can scare or intimidate someone from attacking you in the first place, you know, that's one level of events. But if you can't, then can you be resilient to those attacks? So what we're looking at is, well, what will those attacks come from? What will those threats be? And they're identified as threat vectors. And what's a threat vector? Well, that could be a cyber terrorist. And a cyber terrorist is defined as somebody who has a particular political ideology. And that's what motivates those agents. Uh, a hacktivist. A hacktivist is on a smaller scale, an individual motivated by ideology. So it may not necessarily be a larger political. It could be uh, based on some sort of individual principles or notions. And a state-sponsored attacker. A state-sponsored attacker is different from the other two in that they're agents who are funded by other nation states. So those are usually identified as some sort of external threat instead of an internal threat. That these, that this, that these agents or individuals are being funded. It is part of their job. They're being um, rewarded or um provided some sort of resource money mainly right in order to work for the government so how do we determine who is a national threat on a government level if we're looking at a broader scale there's certain metrics that are been identified on a nation state scale uh, in particular, what we'll talk about here is that the Global Cybersecurity Index, or the GCI, it's a broad index uh, constructed by various stakeholders. And what they have done is brought together a system, like an index, where they want to identify who is um, trustworthy, who is a risk, who is a possible risk, on a nation-state scale. So what governments provide good security are providing those type of resources to their citizens and which are not. And they do so on a five tier criteria. And this is what I talk about is the five pillars of the GCI. Legal measures. So has the government have in place any legal measures in in order to address cybersecurity threats. So they have any laws on the books that actually address what may be a threat in the 21st century. Technical measures. So do they, have they developed the infrastructure? Have they developed uh, software? Do they have some sort of security that those risks, uh, sorry, those resources won't be at risk or violated through technical measures. Um, organizational men measures. So when we look at the larger organization and 
how are they going to respond to this? So if there was an attack on a particular government, um, what sort of procedures do they have in place to respond to that? Uh, capacity building, are they able to address uh, large attacks? Is there a particular threshold where the attack would be so large that they cannot uh, address it by a nation state? So if you have a large government um, and they attack a smaller government in the cyber way, um, would that smaller government have resources, defenses, uh, cyber defenses in order to uh, be resilient against those type of larger attacks. Uh, cooperation, do they seek cooperation with other nation states? Are they creating some sort of cooperative uh, network between various actors so that they're working together in creating a, a cyber defense? So those are the five pillars of the CJ. So they, what they do is they take those uh, particular um, metrics and then try to identify and rate which governments, as you can see on the map, uh, which governments tend to offer strong security under these metrics and which don't. And if you notice uh, from the map, just in general, you don't have to look at any particular specific government, but you've noticed that some governments identified in warmer colors, red, orange, that those governments are having a harder time um, meeting these five pillars. And it's no accident that some of those governments, as you can see, meaning those five pillars, have difficulty because they lack also financial resources uh, as well. So some of the poorer governments who are struggling, uh, developing countries, um, are having a hard time reaching these five pillars. Uh, if they can make the basic necessities, they can meet those basic necessities, um, it's going to be harder for them to provide a cyber defense and cyber protection for resources. So that is one of the threats of the 21st century and is being closely looked upon by the GCI. So now if we take even a closer look, let's say in our own government, the U.S. government, then we're going to start to see it's like, well, what sort of defenses, what sort of structure does the, does the U.S. government have in regards to cyber security? So the U.S. government has its own division dedicated to cybersecurity. And that's the CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, they were established in 2018. They're a relatively new uh, agency, of course. Um, they are under, of course, the larger agency of the Department of Homeland Security. And part of their jurisdiction, not just on an international scale, but they're also responsible for state, local, uh, tribal, um, and territorial governments as well. So um, those are uh, at various scales you can see. So it's not merely at the state level, it could be also at the local level, uh, local government level, um, even tribal situations. Um, because what they're identified is that when we're talking about cybersecurity, the traditional boundaries, uh, physical boundaries, right? Uh, where this country is, where this location is, doesn't seem to hold in the cyber sphere, right? Is that those can be broken, uh, transcended through by means that are much easier than usually in, in regards to traditional approaches. So some of their main responsibilities of the agency are that they offer uh, a cybersecurity network coordinator. And what that means is that they are a coordinator in, in response to any particular threat. That they're bringing together resources and skills and approaches to address these behaviors or these threats. So they see it as they're offering support, they can respond to and provide some level of security. 
they always been interested enough to uh, offer a response to emergency communications. So if we talk about in terms of, um, to go back for a second, we talk about in terms of uh, a hurricane, a natural disaster, uh, phone lines are down, um, Wi-Fi, uh, all sorts of things could happen on, on based on um, natural uh, a natural disaster or something like that, that the CISA would be also responsible for protecting that because that could be an opportunity for a sort of threat vector to come in uh, if the physical defenses are down, right? So they should be able to respond to that uh, and to take proactive measures as well. So that brings us to the risk management assessment that they can provide as well an initial analysis of what are the risks, right? Be they man-made or natural disasters, what are the potential risks um, on the nation's on a nation state with regard to sector security? So uh, do we have certain infrastructure supporting uh, <clears throat> um, cyber uh, resources like uh, like I said right now, Wi-Fi, telephone line, uh, fiber optics, are those near places that could be struck by a natural disaster? Um, would that cause issues in that particular local area? Um, as well as, is this maybe a tower or infrastructure in cyber, uh, like this fiber optic uh, cables or anything like that, are they in a place where they're easily accessible to individuals who might want to sabotage those. So those are things that they would look at. And finally, election security as well. So as we go into the 21st century and things become more digital, we also have to look at, well, what are the risks of uh, possible voter fraud, uh, voter tampering, all these type of things on an electronic digital scale. And that's something that, um, prior that we didn't really consider or worry about uh, when we have the old uh, sort of punch card system. There is some level of that, of course, but uh, now that it's digital, it can be uh, manipulated easier. And so then that's where we get back our um, relation between convenience, right? Versus security, that it might be more convenient to do so, but you know, to vote from your phone, but then we lose some level of security in the process. It becomes harder to secure that information. So this brings us full circle back to, well, who is this individual who's gonna provide this level of security? Who's this individual who can have the skills in order to, to be a defense against possible vectors? So within the U.S. government, there's a number of um, entry-level roles for individuals who are interested in cybersecurity. You could be a systems engineer, uh, systems administrator, a web developer, an IT technician. Um, but there's also mid-level roles too. Security technician, security analyst, uh, penetration tester. Um, that would be part of that risk assessment, right? Uh, and advanced roles, cybersecurity manager, uh, cybersecurity architect, engineer. So they're looking at a larger scale, you know, how does the overall system work and then those agents within the system. So there are different levels and uh, different roles that individuals can look for if they're interested in a cybersecurity career. Now, those positions, of course, they tend to be lucrative as well. Uh, they're well paid. They have provided a lot of um, benefits in regards to healthcare, um, dental plans, life insurance, things like that. Uh, if we're looking at, let's say, a particular uh, position like cybersecurity advisor, which is currently open right now, um, you'll see that. It is a competitive service, but 
it's also on a G GS14. What that means is that they're going to be starting with a salary of um, six figures to 107 to 157 thousand per year. Uh, the position is permanent. Uh, the goals that person will be employed full time, and it's eligible to the public. But there will be, and that comes back again, of course, to that that negotiation between security and convenience. In order to achieve uh, that type of position, you may be asked to, to go through a public trust uh, investigation. So that's a background check where um, you may be looked at uh, according to some forms that I have here, uh, questionnaires that you would have to fill out uh, that would identify what kind of risk you might be on that level. And if you go to um, maybe a position that has more sensitive uh, and these maybe a stronger sort of clearance, uh, security clearance, they'll take a look at your information, your personal information uh, going 10 years or more. Um, so what jobs you've had, uh, an arrest record, if any, um, everything that they can accumulate because that level of your position is going to be a, a sensitive position that's going to require a higher level of trust. And there's a number of initiatives to meet this demand. So like I mentioned earlier in the presentation that the demand is there because the threat is identified as growing. Um, other governments, um, other players, uh, internal and external uh, threat vectors uh, continue to grow. So this is this constant sort of play where the government is going to be in a position of being responsible to engage and step up any sort of initiatives they need in order to secure um, sensitive information. So if we notice that there's a number of initiatives to try to meet that demand, and these particular uh, initiatives that I'm mentioning here are initiatives that are directed at uh, students. So be they undergraduate college students or graduate students, uh, there's uh, just a few to mention the Cyber Student Volunteer Initiative, uh, the Cyber Co-op uh, Corp uh, Scholarship for Service, the National um, Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies. So these are possible avenues if you're interested in pursuing a career in cybersecurity. Um, there's a number of scholarships and other initiatives as well. So I'd like to thank you. Um, for allowing me to present on these topics. Um, if you require any information or additional information or resources, references, uh, I'll be happy to provide those. And I hope you see that uh, the three aspects of coming back to our initial introduction, how the ethical foundations of uh, government responsibility with regards to cybersecurity, the current metrics on how to measure uh, threats on a global level, international level, and possible career opportunities for individuals who are interested in developing a career in cybersecurity in their particular um, country. Thank you.